My son Jack is not here with me today, although he would be tickled to see me on stage talking about him. And about a week ago, I explained that I would be out this afternoon, um, and he asked where. And I said, well, I need to give a talk to some people. And he said, what do they look like? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know, Jack. I've never seen them. <laughs> and he said, what will you tell them? And he had been kind of leaning up against the kitchen counter, popping pretzels in his mouth when he was talking to me. And before I could answer him, he popped the last pretzel in and wandered away. And the truth is, I had been kind of struggling about this talk today and, and how I was going to tell you all the things I wanted to say. I knew I kind of wanted to pull the curtain back on our family's life and give you a glimpse of what it's like to have five kiddos, one of whom is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And at the same time, I wanted to breathe a little life into this phenomenon that is autism. The only way I could think to do that was to tell you a story about a boy named Jack, a boy who has sandy brown hair. And if you're lucky enough to get a glimpse of his eyes, you'll see that they're a sparkly blue. A boy that loves waffles on Thursdays and pancakes on Saturdays a fifth grader who has a full-time paraprofessional or aide. I knew I wanted to tell you what it feels like to be Jack's mother, how time and time again I'm brought to my knees by his autism. And just when I think I'm at my lowest point, I look up and my heart soars to see the way his three brothers and one sister push him and pull him and love him and change him. And every time I looked at my notes to try to pull this story together, I just thought about Jack leaning up against the kitchen counter, popping pretzels in his mouth. And I thought, instead of a traditional speech, I'm going to write a letter to my son. And I'd like to share that letter with you today. Dear Jack, lately people are talking all about autism's rising statistics. They say, it's 1 in 88. Now it's 1 in 55. Where is it coming from? Why are there so many more, and what is causing it? But the truth is, I don't give a damn about the statistics. When people come to me with the numbers, I want to put my hands over my ears and shout, I know all about the numbers. I know about the therapy dogs, and the gluten-free, and the vaccinations, and the allergies, and the hyperbaric chambers. I know about it. Because the truth is, my son has autism. My son has autism. My son has autism. Jack, you have autism. When you were diagnosed almost 10 years ago, I didn't know a single person on the spectrum. In fact, my only experience with it was with this movie called Rain Man, with Tom Cruise. In it. I was terrified when you didn't talk. You didn't point or look at us or even seem to recognize us. And so Daddy and I began this roller coaster of paperwork and evaluations. We learned new terms like joint attention and global delay and pervasive developmental disorder. But still, we thought you'd outgrow it. We thought, we'll get you some speech, you will learn to talk, and this will all be behind us. There was so much Daddy and I did not know back then. Jack, when people bring up the numbers, I want to tell them how every day last year, your six-year-old sister would wait for you to get on the bus after school. And she would walk over to your aide and say, how did he do today? Did he have a good day? Did he get upset? He gets upset. You can get me because I know how to help him. Jack, I want to tell people about movie night in our house. I want to tell people how pretty much once a week we have movie night. And you're very bossy when it comes to choosing the movie. <laughs> and how on this particular night, you decided we needed to all watch The Wizard of Oz. And so we agreed, and we all settled into the story of the Tin Man and the Lion, the Scarecrow, and Toto. And when the movie was over, you sat up on the couch from where you were sitting, and you said, the lion, he has autism. And I sat up from where I was sitting on the couch, and I said, why? 
why would you say that? And you said, because he is afraid all the time. And Jack, that may have been the single most heartbreaking thing I have ever heard. But I'm here today to tell you that you are so brave. Every day you wake up and you pull on your favorite blue shirt and you walk out into a world that is not made for you. A world of loud fire drills, people who talk too fast, and long, busy worksheets. A world that says, not your way, Jack, my way. Your way is wrong, Jack, our way is right. Jack, when you were about three years old, <laughs> For Halloween, I found these three matching frog costumes for you and your brothers to wear. And I was so excited for three frogs. But when I brought the costume out of the bag, you went crazy. You wouldn't even look at it. And finally, I wrestled you into it. And you kind of bit the sleeves, and you tried to shove the hat off your head. And I remember watching you thinking, why can't he be normal? Why can't he be normal? Now there are days when I think, what if he were normal? There's so much I would have missed. But you wish you were normal, I know, Jack. You're in a tender position because you've just begun to discover your own diagnosis. And although Daddy and I are so grateful to be able to consider you high functioning, there is a price that comes with that. And that price is the knowledge that you are different Diagnosed, not normal. Jack, I have many hopes for you, one of which is that someday you'll begin to appreciate your autism as much as I do. Now, I appreciate your autism, but I do not always love it or have patience for it. Just this morning, for example, I was awake before the rest of the house, and I just wanted to have a few sips of coffee before everybody else got out of bed. I did not want to hear a lecture on why the K-cups for the Keurig machine should stay neatly organized according to color and flavor. Jack, when people bring up statistics, I want to talk about your glasses. Do you remember in third grade when we found out you needed glasses? I told you you had an appointment the next day to get fitted, and you went berserk. He threw a tantrum that lasted over two hours, lying on the floor, banging with your fists, jumping up and down and crying, snatching books off the counter. I can read. I read. I can read. I can see. No glasses. Finally, you tired yourself out, and we led you up to bed, and you, you pulled the weighted blanket up to your neck, and you said, I just want for me to be normal. No glasses. I was so discouraged. And I kind of wandered back downstairs to my laptop, and I hopped online and emailed your teacher, Mrs. Brennan, to update her on where we were with your vision. And then I logged into Facebook to just distract myself. And as soon as I logged in, I noticed that Mrs. Brennan had sent out a post. And she had tagged everyone at your school. And the post said, everyone, dust off your glasses. Bring in a pair tomorrow, even if you don't wear them. We need to show a kiddo what normal looks like. The next day, I had to pick you up at the bus stop because we had our appointment. And you got into the car and kind of slumped into the seat next to me, and you said, I will do my best with these glasses. Jack, you are 11 now. You stand almost at my nose. And when we went to buy sneakers last week, we had to go to the men's department. Eleven double digits plus one. Five years until you can drive a car. Six until junior prom. Seven until you can graduate from high school. Ten until you can drink alcohol and live on your own. When I think about you turning eleven, there is a tight, quiet panic in my chest. I feel as though time is running out. But for so long, Jack, 
I wanted a crystal ball to see into your future. When you were a pudgy, delicious three-year-old, I wondered about kindergarten. When you were in second grade, I worried about fourth grade. Now that you're in fifth, I worry about high school, graduation, your life as a man. And yet at the same time, I want to turn the clock back. I want to take my finger and edge the hour and minute hand until it's 2006, 2005, 2004 again. I want to do it over. Although to be honest, I don't know what we would do differently. We had you evaluated when you were a year old, a baby really. You were diagnosed when you were just a toddler. Right away, we started speech therapy, occupational therapy. We begged you to look in our eyes and point to the bird and listen for the plane. We did the hard things. We put you back in your chair 17,436 times during dinner. So you would learn how to sit the meal and eat with a fork. We chased you through the mall so you would hold our hands. We taught you how to tie your sneakers so you wouldn't be the last kid in school wearing Velcro. We showed you how to pray. And yet still I feel as though there is this hourglass bolted down to the kitchen counter. And I only have so long until the sand filters from the top to the bottom. Was it enough? Is it enough? Will it be enough? Jack, every Thursday, your class gets to do something at school called snack shop, where you get to buy an ice cream treat after lunch with the money that you bring in. And so by Tuesday night, you are folding and refolding and packing and repacking your dollar bill. Snack shop for me on Thursday. I will get the crazy cone. It tastes so good. And watching you fold and refold your dollar bill makes my heart pull in a thousand directions. It's just one more example of your youngness, your naivete. And the things I need to prepare you for pile up in my mind like thick, wet snowflakes. How will we keep you safe from internet scams and sexual predators? How will you learn politics or the subtleties of romance and algebra? I guess, Jack, what I really want is not a crystal ball to look forward or to redo the past, but to hold time perfectly still in my hands. Because if I hold time still, I can keep you from being lonely or sad or lost. I can keep you safe. If I hold time perfectly still, I can't look forward or backward. I can only look at you. I can only see how possible you are. But time stands still for nothing or no one, not even autism. So for now, I will try to remember that your progress has never been a linear equation, but rather a complicated algorithm of puddle jumping and regression, untied shoelaces and forks that you threw on the floor. I will try to remember that your future, your hourglass, is unlike any other in the entire world. Jack, a lot of times people ask me if I have any advice about autism. And I'm always sort of chuckling to myself and I wave my hand and I say, no, please, I can barely figure him out. But when I say this, a memory pulls at my subconscious from about two years ago, when the whole family went camping. Do you remember, Jack? We bought a 10-person tent and an air mattress so the whole family could sleep together. And as soon as we got to the campground, we set up the tent. And then all five of you kids took turns rolling around on the air mattress and digging your dirty feet into our pillows. So Daddy and I declared it for grown-ups only. We had a busy day, swimming and hiking and cooking. And at night, the temperature dropped right along with the sun, and it got pretty chilly out. So we bundled into sweatshirts and pajamas and headed into bed. And somewhere around 2 AM, you started to call for me, Mom, on the mattress. I want on the mattress. And I said, no, Jack, go back to bed. Mom, Mom, the mattress. Go back to sleep, Jack, before you wake everyone else up. 
Well, the next morning, everybody was up early, and I was sitting in a chair outside of the tent, and you came in and kind of squashed right in next to me, and, and you had your, your eyes downcast, and you said, in the night, in the night I was colded. And I looked down and realized you had wiggled out of your pajama pants, and you weren't wearing your sweatshirt. All night long, you were cold, freezing, probably. Once again, I was foiled by the limits of your expressive language. Jack, I can't tell you how many times I thought about that night. And every time I think of it, I hate myself. I make mistakes. Every day I make mistakes. So the next time somebody asks me about autism, I think I'm just going to tell them the truth. Autism is scary. It's confusing. It's exhilarating and it is electrifying. It is extraordinary, and yet it is ordinary. And from it, I have learned that all I need to do is listen when there are no words, and feel the lion's fear inside your heart, and most of all, to warm you when you are colded. Because the truth is this, my son has autism, a beautiful, possible, boy named Jack.